Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I want to talk about one of the strongest storms in many, many years to hit my state. It was called Typhoon Merbach, and it hit western Alaska late last week and into the weekend. It brought gale force winds, massive flooding, loss of power, water communications. It has wreaked havoc. Madam President, I have some just a few photos here. You see a house literally floating away into the ocean. Whole communities completely flooded. Giant wave systems. Uh, again, communities completely flooded in western Alaska. This is an area of our state dotted with dozens of small villages. Nearly all of them, majority Alaska Native communities. Roughly about 21,000 people live in these communities in western Alaska with the coastline of roughly 1,300 miles. That's just one little small part of my state, but that's just about as many miles of all the Florida coastline combined. Just here in western Alaska. Got hammered. Very, very few roads. Alaska has over 200 communities that are not connected by any roads at all, so presents many challenges in terms of relief. And unfortunately, the very small number of roads that we have, many were washed away in these communities. The storm knocked out lines of communication, prompted evacuations, wrenched homes from their foundations, as I mentioned, floating in the water. The preliminary assessment, Madam President, shows very significant damage, damage to bridges, roads, water treatment plants, bulk fuel tanks, seawalls, breakwaters, airstrips. If you don't have a road, every one of these small communities has an airport, a tiny little airport, generators, power plants. This was a devastating storm, but I'm proud to say my fellow Alaskans pulled together, the native communities in particular, as they do so often, to make sure that all residents, and particularly the most vulnerable, the elderly in particular, were out of harm's way when this storm came pounding ashore in western Alaska. Our state and local government emergency management teams, the Alaska National Guard, the Coast Guard, our first responders, have also been working day and night to ensure that communities are safe, that utilities, services, and major infrastructure are becoming operational as soon as possible, but it's still a real challenge. I will say from the federal government's perspective, FEMA has done a good job thus far, a really good job. They immediately got teams on the ground and are working to evaluate the damage. The head of FEMA, who I spoke to uh, shortly after the storm hit, is on her way to Alaska. The Secretary of Homeland Security was, uh, just called me today on their focus on this. The Region 10 FEMA director, which covers Alaska, is also on the ground there. Thankfully, thank God, there have been no reports of death or serious injury, and it's in part because of the resilience of the people in Alaska and the preparation. Further, donations of food, water, clothes, essential from, and other essentials from businesses and nonprofits and just generous individuals throughout Alaska have been pouring in to this community. So we are so grateful for all the help that has come even though most Americans are very unaware of this, this was a devastating storm. Let me talk a little bit about some of these wonderful communities that were hit by the storm. All of these communities, I've spent a lot of time in western Alaska, amazing people, incredible generosity of spirit, thriving Alaska Native cultures. But Madam President, these are some of the poorest communities in America poorest communities in America. Like I said, almost none of them have roads. 
Several of them do not have any water or sewer, running water or flush toilets. American citizens. You know, I get a little frustrated in this body whenever there's a lower 48 community that has a problem with drinking water. The latest is Jackson, Mississippi, Detroit, Michigan. There's all this money to go, hey, let's fix that aging infrastructure. I get it. That's important. But what I always say is, like, why don't we fix communities like mine who have no infrastructure, no water and sewer, no flush toilets, no access to the internet, housing where multiple generations are often crammed together. And here's the thing, Madam President, these are some of the most amazing people on the planet. And as Americans, they're some of the most patriotic people in the whole country. I always like to brag about Alaska, more veterans per capita than any state in the country. But the Alaska Native people serve at higher rates in the US military than any other ethnic group in America, what I call special patriotism. You go to these small communities, everyone there is a veteran. It really warms your heart as an American. So we need to help these communities, and we're going to do that. The Senate's going to do that. The federal government's going to do that. The state of Alaska is going to do that. I do want to make one mention to one issue that's important to me, Madam President, and it's an issue just of fairness, and I'm just kind of putting down a marker to make sure we have fairness as it relates to my constituents in this um, very significant storm that we need help with. The majority leader was here on the floor recently talking about the impact that Hurricane Fiona was having on Puerto Rico, and we're all thinking about Puerto Rico as well. Want to make sure they're all safe. And that's something we need to be focused on in the federal government, in the U.S. Senate. Now, normally, the federal government pays for 75% of the costs of emergency medical care, disaster response, food distribution, when those requests are made. Our governor just recently declared a federal disaster for this part of Alaska. The Alaska delegation sent a letter to the president urging him to immediately approve this federal disaster declaration for Alaska. And when this happens, as I mentioned, the federal government usually pays 75 percent. Others are responsible back home for 25 percent. Sometimes it's even 90 percent and 10 percent. As I mentioned, the majority leader recently requested in a floor speech on the Senate floor, and I'm fine with the speech, that the FEMA federal government pay 100% of the costs in Puerto Rico. Okay, if FEMA wants to do that, if that's going to happen at the request of the majority leader, here's what else has to happen. Then FEMA must pay 100% of the costs in Western Alaska. Okay, that's a no-brainer. 100% of the costs from FEMA in Puerto Rico, then the great people in Western Alaska are going to get 100% of the costs paid for as well. As a matter of fact, Madam President, I'd like to submit a, rec a letter to the record for the record that I led with Senator Murkowski and Congresswoman Peltola to Administrator Criswell, the director of FEMA, just making note that, hey, if you're going to do 100% for Puerto Rico, you need to make sure you're doing 100% for Western Alaska. And I'd like to submit that for the record. Without objection. So, Madam President, one of the things that I've always done in my job here in the U.S. Senate is whenever there's a bill dealing with disaster relief, regardless of what part of the country it is, I always vote for it. And the reason I do that is because I come from a state that has earthquakes, that has wildfires, that has typhoons, that has a lot of cold weather. So we're tough in Alaska, but every now and then we're going to need federal help as well. And now is the time we do. So we're all going to work together here in the Senate, whether it's Puerto Rico or Kentucky 
or Western Alaska, where there's been a lot of recent natural disasters, and work together. And I just want to make sure my constituents know we got your back here in D.C. We thank you for your resiliency, toughness, and everybody coming together. And we'll make sure that whatever the results are in any of these other natural disasters, that Alaska is going to get the same result as well. I yield the floor.